This program is a part of the Full Press Radio Network. Find this and all of Full Press Coverage's shows on fullpressradio.com or free on the Full Press Coverage app, available now on the Apple and Google Play stores. I'm Scott Pioli, and you're listening to the Eye Test for Two. Well, welcome to the Cinco de Mayo edition of the Eye Test for Two. I'm Clark Judge. I'm Ira Kaufman. And as I hope you know by now, we are both Hall of Fame voters joined, as we always are, by Hall of Fame producer Ian Glendon. And, and today, by a special guest. And I'm talking about Atlanta Falcons president and CEO Rich McKay, who's also chairman of the NFL's competition committee, and who, I don't, I don't know if you know this, with 26 years on that board, is the longest standing member in the history of the committee. But that's not all. As Ira and Ian, and really anyone who lives in the Tampa area knows, as GM of the Tampa Bay Bucks, and this was a while ago, but Rich took Warren Sapp and Derek Brooks in the first round of the 1995 draft, thus becoming the only general manager in NFL history to have his first two draft picks become Hall of Famers. Rich McKay, congratulations, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, Clark, thank you. It's nice to be here. Happy to be with you guys. Rich, I want to ask you uh, about a founding member of your franchise here in Atlanta. 1966, Falcons joined the league. First pick, one of the great college players in history, named Tommy Nobis. Plays 11 years, Rich, all with the Falcons. And may I say, Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not believe there's anybody with a gold jacket that has played their entire career with the Atlanta Falcons uh, up to this point. So, Rich, 11 years, he never got in a playoff game, Rich. Never got in a playoff game, and I think it's fair to say, Rich, they they were not number one broadcast team uh, back then for Falcon broadcasts, and that hurts too, but... Rich, tell tell uh, our listeners a little bit about Tommy Nobis and how he is uh, kind of get lost in the shuffle sometimes. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so, you know, I've, I've known, I got to know Tommy uh, when I first got to Atlanta. I didn't know Tommy, you know, before I got to Atlanta. I knew the player. I'd heard of the player. But I also, I kind of knew the experience and the story of Tommy because I knew it through the eyes of Leroy Selman. Leroy Selman was the first pick of the Bucks. He was the best player on the Bucks. He was the best player on a bad team for a number of years. Uh, but the difference the Bucs had is they had some success with Leroy. And he went to some playoff games and he got noticed and only played nine years in the league. But he impacted the franchise tremendously. And so in Tampa, they actually took a piece of interstate, a connector, if you will, of interstate and named it after. And then he ended up in the Hall of Fame after nine years of playing. So I come here, and all of a sudden, here's Tommy Nobis, first pick of the franchise, best player on a really bad team, five, you know, uh, Pro Bowl appearances in 11 years, two times all pro. But the other thing, I is he is on the all-decade team in the 1960s. So he's recognized as an elite player, uh, but he played for really bad teams and teams that weren't competitive. And the franchise was never competitive for an awfully long time. So I think he just got lost in the shuffle. And it bothers me because I look at franchises and I look at seminal players, meaning that first pick of the franchise, whether it's Seattle, whether it's uh, Tampa, wherever it may be. But here in Atlanta, you know, everybody still refers to Tommy as Mr. Falcon and Mr. Falcon is in the Hall of Fame and it does not make me happy. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I got to know him. I got to know his statistics. I got to know who he was. And when you talk to the when you talk to the players that played, it was 
hey, this was a really tough place to play. This was a really tough place to, to, to be a part of because we weren't winning. We weren't competitive. But there was one guy that wasn't having any of it, and that was Tommy. And so uh, I'm, a, I'm a Tommy Novus fan. Rich, uh, on terms of the competition committee, um, tell me a little bit, Rich, uh, the, the safety issues, which is paramount and ha- has been paramount for the NFL. And, Rich, the very, very difficult job of kind of balancing that out with not taking away the, the essence of the NFL, the physicality. Um, and it's a constant battle, Rich, and you hear from the offensive players and the, and the defensive coaches are screaming at you, Rich, every year with the committee. And how, how do you handle that and, and how vexing is it? Yeah, well, we have, we have we, we kind of look at this. Here's our North Star, right? The North Star on the competition committee is our job is to make sure that, that we protect players from unreasonable risk of injury. Notice the word unreasonable. Because there is a risk of injury. We're a contact sport. This is a tough, this is a tough guy sport and it's played at a fast speed with big men. But we need to look for unreasonable risk of injury. And the thing I like today, Ira, uh, I, I've been on the committee a long time. Clark said it earlier, just a long time. And I've seen the change. When we were on, when I was on the committee in the 90s, you know, Coach Shula was the chairman and, and George Young was the co-chairman. You know, we were trying to figure out what the issues were with safety. We didn't know. We didn't have data. We knew basic injury data, but, I mean, it was basic. We certainly didn't have concussion data. Uh, and, and so we made changes. We came up with this idea called the defenseless player, which was this idea of the receiver up in the air getting hit. And over the years, we extended that. So as you go through our safety journey, um, what I'm proud of is I think today we don't do anything without data. We don't do anything without hard, we have hard engineering injury data. And what we try to say is, listen, if we can make it, we can make a difference and we can move the needle and it's, it's real and we're taking away unreasonable risk of injury, we're going to do it. So when we figured out a couple of years ago that, Hey, on the punt play, on the interception and on the uh, kickoff play, these blindside blocks are causing an unreasonable number of concussions. And all they are is a block from from somebody that is coming parallel or back to their line of scrimmage against another player, and they're surprising them, and they're hitting them, and they're hitting them hard, and that surprising hit is causing a concussion. We said, you know, what would happen if we outlawed it? Well, everybody said, well, you can't block them. How do you screen them? How do you do whatever? Well, you know what? They did it. We got rid of 100% of concussions from blindside blocks because we don't have them anymore. The NCAA did it. They don't have them anymore. So we really moved the needle there. Um, And that happened because we had really good data. So I think we've come a long ways. I think today you don't see the discussion of health and safety, um, you know, in the New York Times or other places that you would have, because I think they do realize we're all in for it. We're going to get this right. And we're going to chip away at it when we need to. It's going to make the game evolve a little bit. People are going to change some of their schemes and some of their blocks. But when they do, they'll they'll figure it out. We got awfully smart coaches. And how much pushback do you get, Rich, uh, particularly from uh, coaches with a defensive pedigree? What are they telling you? I think the first thing you get out in pushback is those people that feel like you're coming for their scheme. Oh, you're you're going to outlaw this. So that's because we do this, you know. And and you try to come back and say, no, we have coaches on our committee that are offensive coaches, defensive co- coaches. We have coaches that may have your scheme. And, and, and yet we're, we're, you know, we're going to try to come up with a rule. So we're not targeting you. We're not doing this about you. We're doing this for the game. I think one of the things that I take great pride in uh, on the competition committee, and I learned it from George Young. George Young taught me, you know, first day I think I ever went to the committee, I showed up and I had a shirt on that had a Buccaneer logo on it. And, uh, you know, everybody's sitting in there. And, and there were other people that had logos on their shirts. So I wasn't the only guy. George Young called me at lunch. He said, hey, remember you don't ever wear your logo into this room. And I said, really? I said, George, there's other people. He said, no, I don't mean it that way. I mean it the way you sit in the committee. You don't ever sit in this committee as a member of an organization. You sit as a member of the National Football League, and you represent football and the National Football League. And I said, you know, it's a really good point. He said, so don't ever worry about a rule as it impacts your scheme. Don't ever worry about a rule as it may impact one of your coaching techniques. 
The issue is, is this in the best interest of the game? And I would say that has really served me well. We're with Atlanta's Rich McKay on the eye test for two. And Rich, uh, since you mentioned George, um, we knew him for a long time. My wife worked with him in the NFL office. I'll ask you a self-serving question. How gratified are you that he's finally in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? I, uh, Clark, I am really jacked. I, 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 I didn't. I didn't like George. I love George. Uh, I consider George a friend, a mentor. He was a special guy for me. Um, I have so many memories of George. Uh, but what I loved about George was that uh, football, incredible that a teacher that became a scout, that became incredible how his path got him to be kind of, in my mind, he's one of those founding fathers of the NFL. And you say, well, how is that possible? He, he wasn't there the first hundred years. No, he was there in a, critical time of the league and he um he did so much for the game and what i loved about george is as he was getting to the end of his time in in the giants first of all he had a successor in place he had ernie ready to go secondly he he um he kind of wanted to walk away from it but you know paul talked him into staying and it was great he was so impactful to us uh and, and so impactful to the game so i'm a i'm a george young guy Um, I think that when people dedicate as much as he dedicated to the game, whether that's the Tex Trams or the George Youngs, and they have the impact that they had, even though a lot of people don't know it, they don't know it. You know, Joe Joe Fan sitting somewhere and watching a game in a bar in Arkansas has no idea who George Young is. But you know what? That game he's enjoying is a better game because of George. You know, it's interesting, Rich, is that uh, I'm – on the uh, contributor committee, I was on the senior committee of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And in one of those sessions, we had a couple of consultants, as you know, who visit with us. And, and um, one of them said, if you guys had met, you know, the first time and, and pulled together all the candidates in 2015, I think was our first vote. The first two guys who went who should should have gone in were Paul Tagliabue and George Young. Those are the first two. And here we were years later. And they were still on the board and they didn't get in until the Centennial Committee of 2020. Yet there were consultants who went into that room with us at the contributors saying these should have been the first two guys off the board. Well, I I don't know the other people that came off the board. And and I do know probably some of them, but I don't know the names as we speak. But I will tell you those two, um, very impactful. The thing I would say about Commissioner Tagliabue is, what he doesn't get enough credit for is what he walked into. I mean, he walked into a holy war between a union and, and management that people act like today, oh, there's disagreements. Oh, I read where the union says this. Listen, compared to what that was and where we were and where that relationship was, uh, he created a partnership with Gene Upshaw that has served our current players and our current teams incredibly well. And those two are the two that crafted it. A lot of people have supported them, but those are the two that crafted it. And I give uh, Paul all the credit in the world for, for the impact he had there. Rich, um, uh, a few weeks back, uh, I believe you addressed um, the league owners, uh, you know, in general terms about the 2020 season. Uh, Rich, I know you don't want to get into specifics, but um what kind of year was it from an officiating standpoint? Uh, and what were some of the points you made in terms of uh, competitiveness, scoring, um, uh, some general general remarks you made to the uh, ownership? Yeah, I don't have my notes here, Ira, but I'll, I'll give them to you. I'll give them to you off the cuff. Uh, you know, we've never had the highest scoring year we've ever had in football ever, right? 49 points, something points. It's crazy. We're, we're literally on the verge of 50 points a game. Um That's surprising to me. Um, What what also is surprising is we typically are a league that starts a little slow. The quality of our games in weeks one, two, even sometimes in week three, are are usually, you know, average to below. How do you measure that, Rich? How do you measure that? You measure measure by penalties per game, measure by offensive production, measure by time of game, measure by plays per game, measure by the big numbers, right? What do the big numbers tell you? And in this year... I mean, it's incredible how quickly we got to good quality football. Now, it probably allowed the offenses to be ahead of the defenses. For some reason, I'm still not sure, because typically when we we have less practice, it's the other way around, you know, in camp. 
but it felt like the offenses began to click awfully early this year. Uh, now, I, I give you a, another couple of things that I, I, I like to point out about this year is think of it, Ira, in, in terms of baseball, right? Baseball umpires, um, when the season's over, they take a break. Then they go umpire games in the Dominican. Then they go umpire local games. Then they go spring training. They umpire a million games. So they, they have literally thousands and thousands of live rep practices. Our officials this year, that's the number of plays they officiated prior to the first snap of the first game. And that number, you can times it by any number you want. And I know you're not good at math, but if you times it by any number you want, you still get the same number. It's still zero. Okay. They weren't allowed to come to training camp. They didn't come. We didn't have OTAs. Okay. There was no preseason games. So it was very challenging on our officials to walk onto that field, never having seen a play at full speed in a year or, you know, eight months um, and officiate. And I thought they did a really good job given that circumstance because it's not so easy. You can do all the tape work you want. You can do all the, hey, mechanics, stand here, do this, move your eyes here. You can do all that you want, Ira, but you need some practice. And uh, everybody needs practice. And they didn't get any. And so I was, I was very impressed by the way it went. We definitely had an anomaly this year in offensive holding. Numbers were way down. Uh, there were definitely some mechanics that they put in place that probably brought those numbers down. As a competition committee, we, we looked at over 100 offensive holding uh, calls and no calls for the season. We made some suggestions. Uh, we wrote up a whole three-page uh, piece in our report on why we think some of those mechanics should be different for um, uh, 2021, and I think we'll be in a good place. How, how are the numbers for pass interference, Rich? Uh, OPI, offensive pass interference, was down. Defensive pass interference was up. Uh, offensive pass interference was probably down a little more, um, let's call it a little more noticeable than, than defensive pass interference was up. But it clearly, um, th there, there was a little change there. Uh, we watched a lot of it, and I wouldn't say there was a, you know, a lot we thought they got you know, terribly wrong. Um, hardest call in football is going to be that call, Ira, because that call is 100% subjective. You're really looking for advantage game. And um, these are big athletic people that, that a lot of times at the top of the route are running full speed. They're exchanging, you know, hand checks and the like. Very hard, hard penalty to call. Rich, closer to home, uh, some of your early impressions on your new GM and your new coach. Uh, you know, very happy. Um, you know, we, we, so, so here's the, the, the good and the bad, right? The bad is that, that we had to make a coaching change and made our coaching change, uh, and our GM change at week five. That is bad. You do not want to be in that position. Okay. We still had, you know, 11 games to go, 12 weeks to go. Um, but the good in that was we didn't waste one day of time. We began to go to work on that search, on the background. We wanted to make sure that our, our search was wide, it was diverse, and that we looked at everybody, people we didn't know. Uh, we hired two people that I, I've never met before. I never met the, I've never met the general manager. Uh, we never met him during the interview process. Uh, so I uh, only met him on, on, uh, on Zoom as we sit here today. Uh, but it turned out really well. We did a lot of research, a lot of work. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy with where they are. What I liked most about our draft and our draft prep was I think that one of the most important things you can do as an organization for long-term success is, you know, have a clear understanding of how you're going to collaborate. How are the coaches going to fit in? How are the scouts going to fit in? How is decisions going to be made? And I thought their collaborative effort between Terry and Arthur, Arthur Smith uh, was excellent. We're speaking with Atlanta's Rich McKay, who's also the head of the NFL's competition committee. And Rich, since you brought up the pass interference penalty, I wanted to ask you about something. Uh, we, we've known Mike Pereira for years. Uh, he was in New York when I lived there, and he cer certainly was the head of officiating there. I used to speak to him all the time. And one of his big deals, as I know you know, was pass interference. We need to go to the college rule because it's unfair to penalize teams 50, 40 yards 
for one play, especially when it's subjective. Why hasn't that got more m momentum? And where does that issue stand now? Is it a hot button issue or not? No, it really isn't, uh, Clark. It gets brought up. Um, I'm not going to say every year. Maybe it's every other year. Uh, but but it, it is, uh, it's almost always put out pretty quickly by the defensive coaches. Because our defensive coaches are quick to say, remember, and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense about college corners, but college corners don't play in the pros. You know, so, you know, you have 50,000, you know, kids that are playing scholarship football. And we only get 270 of them, you know, that come into our draft, 250. Right. I mean, so just think of that ratio. Our athletes are superior athletes uh, at that corner position and safety position. And they're quick to say, listen, if you go to the college rule, you're going to see a lot more uh, pass interference in the fourth quarters. You're going to see it's going to happen because we're going to tell them that there's no, you cannot run this risk. Then people say, well, why don't you go to the, um, if it's egregious, um, it'll be, it'll be a spot foul, but if it's not, it'll be 15 yards. Right. We correct. did, we did that Clark with the, with the face mask. And as you know, we went away from it because we just said, Hey, listen, there's so much objectivity here. If we do that, we're, we're going to put that officially in a harder position. So um, we've been, you know, Pete Carroll always gives a good speech on this. He is a guy that coached in college. He is a guy that was a secondary coach. He was a coordinator, and now he's a head coach, again, back in the NFL, successful at every level and at every position. And he's quick to say, absolutely not. You do not want it. And if we get it, you would change football. Wow. Okay. Um, so that's kind of always been – that's always what's, what's guided us. Well, in terms of changing football, you had, I think, six rules changes for the coming year. But one of them was not the – penalty for an offensive player fumbling through the end zone oh. out of the end zone whatever it is and that seemed to be a hot button topic after the cleveland kansas city game as i think you remember and we've seen it before every time it happens someone goes the dumbest rule ever get rid of it why wasn't there more momentum when it seemed like there was sort of at the end of the season but then it yeah. kind of died out we never even Boy, in our discussions um, this offseason, which were unusual, right, because they were all by, you know, by Zoom, by Teams yep. uh, meetings, um, the way we did them is we took our total time that we normally would do and we just basically split it up. So we started for two weeks in a row. We kind of met three hours a day, uh, you know, because you get a little bit of fatigue uh, in, in looking at the screen. Um, I would say I didn't even know that we discussed it this year. We've discussed it other years a lot for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to why not, right? Because it sounds like it's an easy why. Yeah, right. Um, the why is, oh, does it seem like it's an overpunishment? The guys fumbled, and, and instead of it, if it had gone out of the one, they would have got the ball to one, but it goes through the end zone. Why is it a touchback? It's always gotten to this theory that, that has said that um, you don't want people putting the ball at risk. We don't want people putting the ball at risk in the field of play, and we certainly don't want them putting the ball at risk when they get to the goal line. So this move, this decision to, to put the ball out, means the ball is at risk. If you do it in the field of play, guess what happens? The defense gets the ball because they recover. Okay? So now all of a sudden, you've done it again at the goal line, and you get rewarded. You get to get the ball back because the ball went out of the end zone. They couldn't get to it in time. They couldn't get and you get, and so you get the ball back. So it's like, hold it. We just rewarded you for the risk you took. So that's why we've, we've always kind of stayed away from that. Um, I still have Don Shula in my mind and that he used to say, he used to scream of anybody that puts the ball out here, they're not playing anymore. You know, he just, <laughs> we couldn't even understand this theory of, of reaching. Um, but that's kind of how we've looked at it, right? In that, in that, you are taking something away from the defense because defense now only has 10 yards and, th and then they can't get the ball anymore. Yeah. And now if it goes out of bounds, I know everybody says, well, if it goes out of bounds, that's different, right? Could be different. We've just looked at it as though we got, we got a rule that we've had in play forever. People know the rule, the players know the rule and the players know don't take the risk. If you take the risk, you're risking losing the ball. So that's not a rule that's likely to change in the near future. I, I it, it, maybe there'll be some big play. I know I, I've read where people say, well, there's going to be that big play and then they're going to change it. Maybe Clark, cause that does happen. I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. I thought that big play was in the playoff game, but apparently not. No, it really didn't. I wouldn't say that drove, 
you know, n- neither team from that game, you know, came in and said, hey, we want you guys to look at this. Wow. And in our survey, we survey all the teams. And I would say, uh, I'm trying to, I, unless I'm not remembering, I don't remember anybody bringing it up. Rich, uh, last one for me. Thanks so much for your time, buddy. Um, Rich, I'm going to end with some thoughts on uh, COVID-19. Uh, first, Rich, how proud are you uh, about the way uh, the league handled it and getting uh, 256 games in and the Super Bowl on time? Rich, and two, uh, how normal do you anticipate 2021 to be in terms of uh, fans um, and uh, instruction on the field and things going on in the facility? Uh, what's your anticipation of uh, 2021? You know, I, I can't, uh, you know, I, I'll give you the, the, the what I'm supposed to give you a little bit of the speak, but I, I just cannot say how proud I am of the league, the players, the union, the coaches. Uh, it was a virtual slog to get through that season. It was hard. It was not easy on anybody. And it was specifically hard on the players and the coaches. Um, I mean, there's no let up. You know, we tested every day from – July 18th until January 5th, every single day, seven days a week. Now, obviously, the playoff teams kept testing beyond that. Um, on the road, it was um, anything but comfortable. One of the things we do well in the league, as a league is we travel well, right? It's comfortable for the players. It's good. This was uncomfortable, you know, in the way we had to travel and what went on in hotels and, and the way you got food. And the, the whole thing was, was, was a challenge. Um, and I just give Alan Sills, I give the union doctors, I give everybody credit because what we did is we just kept evolving. Every time something would come up, we would just kind of up our protocol or change our protocol. And that allowed us to um, feel relatively safe in the buildings. We didn't have a lot of people here, that's for sure, but we felt relatively safe. And I think the players felt safe. So I, I'm, you know, uh, you know, to get to 256 was – I'm not sure I would have bet on it early on, uh, but it was uh, it was well done by a lot of people, by the league, by the union, and by the players and coaches. Fan wise, uh, it was one of the weirdest things. I think when we played in Green Bay, and I, it was a night game, so I don't know if it was a Thursday night game, Sunday night game, Friday night. I don't know what it was a night game. I just remember that. I've never been in an environment that, that was that strange. I mean, I've you know my whole life I've been going to Green Bay. My dad, I started going to Green Bay in 1977 or. 76, whatever our first year, year was there. And to go into that stadium and there were this many fans, zero. And the players were talking during the break and you could hear them. And I'm like, this is not, this is not normal. Uh, that was very challenging. Uh, and no, you will not see that this coming year. Our intent in Atlanta, you know, we, we followed the lead of the commissioner. We, we intend to be a full stadium. Uh, we intend to be a full stadium to show you, Ira. We intend to be a full stadium for our soccer uh, club, which uh, in its games that play May 15th, I think we start and we'll, we'll be full. So we're, we're moving towards that direction. Hopefully, you know, I, I truly believe the vaccine is the path back. Uh, so hopefully those continue. We're doing it at our stadium. We're giving about 10,000 vaccines a day. So we're, we're trying to do our part. Um, let's hope we get there. But that that is our intent. How about training camp and uh, and the facility? Rick? Yeah. I think you'll have protocols. I think those protocols would not be what they were last year. I hope I would like to be better than that. Uh, I look at our building today. Um, our players aren't here yet. They'll come in when we get to phase two. Um, those that, that choose to come in. Uh, but in our building itself, I think we have three people that are not fully vaccinated because they've still got one more shot to take. Otherwise we're hundred percent vaccinated. So we're making progress, and that should lead to what I think will be less protocols. Rich, Ira is fully vaccinated, so you cannot deny him access to your facility. Okay, <laughs> he is permanently banned. Okay, that's that's one of those. That's it. It's a simple thing, there, Clark. That's not you. You know how you can negotiate when you're permanently banned, you're out. That's a I no told can him do. until Tommy Novus is in the Hall of Fame, he's banned. <laughs> Rich, I've got a couple last ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when the 49ers, a team that I covered years ago, but when they traded up to get the third pick of the draft, as you know, they gave up 
three first rounders and a uh, third rounder. And then the Rams to get Matt Stafford and Jalen Ramsey, they gave up, I think, five first round draft picks. Once upon a time, and not that long ago, it seemed like first rounders were treated like gold. You didn't get rid of them. They were treated like gold. It doesn't seem like that's the case so much now. Has the value changed? I don't know if the values changed. I think the way teams approach it may change. And teams are approaching it, Clark, a little bit of, um, you know, they can find uh, some of those players. In Jalen Ramsey's case, they can find some of those players in a proven player that they can go trade for. And so if you say a first rounder is you've got a 60% chance of that player being a real player, that pick being a real player, or some people say 50%, but let's say it's 60%. And I can go get Jalen Ramsey, who's a multi Pro Bowl player, proven, you know who he is. Well, I'm willing to give two of those. You know, I mean, that's kind of, I think, the way some of that logic's going. And uh, and then I look back at the Rams and say, hey, they've won pretty good since, you know, less and, you know, and, and Sean McVay have been there and doing that. So they've yeah. got they've got some method to, to their their thoughts. It's not for everybody. You know, there's going to be some traditionalists who say, hey, listen, you got to keep those young guys. you got to keep growing them. you got to keep, you know, uh, incubating them. But free agency, you know, has, has evolved over the years. And, and I think people are looking at it as a place where they can find starters. They can plug people in. And so maybe they find a little less value in draft picks. I don't. I, I'm one, always one that makes me nervous. Um, I don't know what the future holds, so I'm – I'm one that would like to say, hey, let's be careful in that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly understand it and see it. Okay. And lastly, as the head of the competition committee, what in your mind is the biggest issue facing the league either this season or in the next five to 10 years? It'll never stop being for me, Clark, because I've been on the committee 20 something years. Um, it'll never stop being player safety because the game itself is a good game. Um, and uh, the game evolves over time. And the way it evolves is guys that are really smart, the Bill Belichick's of the world, and, these, and they're very smart people, that they come up with ways to, to, to gain advantages, right? And what the competition committee's job is to do is to figure out as we go through that how those advantages are being gained. And maybe in the rules, we need to manipulate those rules a little bit to, to level the playing field. And the way the playing field's been leveled from my perspective, has always been a little this way, meaning offense, defense. We've never, we're never shooting for a, we don't want a 3-0 soccer match. We're not looking for that. It's not, that's not what we're looking for. So we're always doing that. But, and I say to you, Clark, that's not hard for us to do. The hard thing for us to do, and the one that we always have to stay focused on, is not to get surprised on the, on the injury front and on the player health and safety front. We need to be ahead of that. We need to see things coming. We need to find ways uh, to have our rules fit with how players play the game and keep them safe from unreasonable risk of injury without, to your earliest point that we started, you know, the podcast on, without, you know, in, in endangering the game. The game is still a, a physical, fast football game. Um, but the, the game has changed. And as it's evolved, we need to make sure we're always on the player health and safety front. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that balance because I would think from the standpoint of people like Ira, and me, who've been around a long time, there's a feeling that there is an imbalance, that the rules changes are always in favor of the offense at the expense of the defense. And maybe unlike you, I got to be honest with you, I love watching a Steelers-Ravens 14-10 game because it does remind me of some of those games I saw in the 70s or the 60s. You know, they run the ball, tough, hard defense, that sort of thing. Um, but it does seem as if it's – the rules changes have been in favor more of the offense than they have the defense. I, I don't, that's true. I think over time that that's, that's, that's kind of true, uh, Clark, but I would say to you that, that some of the rules changes that were done, specifically the player health and safety rules uh, changes that were done, they were not done to disadvantage the defense, hmm. but they did disadvantage the defense. Right. Right. Okay. So, and, and so I don't, I'm not, that's, that's the way I'd say that to you. There's no question that the result was, hey, cover two, mm, hard to play now. Okay, all of a sudden the safety is, you know why? Because safety was taught in those days to play the player, not the ball. And accordingly, he went and hit the player. He didn't even worry about what the ball was. Well, you know what? That that doesn't seem right from health and safety standpoint. No, that's point. right. So, that's so right. some of those rules, I think sometimes people look and say, well, you guys are just doing it to score more points. No, 
it's health and safety. And the cause or the effect may be that, that defense gets a little disadvantage. But we're not – nobody wakes up and says we want 50 points a game. We do wake up and say we do not want below 40 points a game. There is a, there is a place where we, we try to fit it in. Um, but I would tell you there are not rules that we pass just to say, hey, let's help the offense. Yeah, let's go. No. And that's a point well taken because Ira again and I both remember the days when you didn't cross the middle as a wide receiver – unless it was at your own risk and Absolutely. It was at your own risk. And, and we know some of the incidents that happened anyway, Rich, thanks so much. I will tell you, honestly, this has been a real upset today because generally when we have anyone on the podcast, Ira will always ask them about a candidate that he's going to present so that they can write his presentation for him. And it's usually <laughs> someone like John Lynch, who's already in or Rondé Barber. He didn't ask you Rondé Barber today. So I guess yeah. Ira, that's for another podcast. Well, McKay's coming back next week for part two, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know you you don't need the you don't need the old bald guy, but I hey I am a Rondé Barber guy, Clark, in case you need to know. Okay, I know you would be. <laughs> so are we, by the way. Rich McKay, thanks so much for the time. And you know what? I got some good news for you. I think you probably saw the Ivy League returns to fall sports this Music. fall. So you can follow Princeton football from your home in Atlanta. Which is really cool because I know a lot of the kids uh one of the guys I work with forever, his son plays on a team and they decided as a team, I think, you know, maybe there's 10 of them that they took the year off. Oh, wow. They took the year off their senior year, of Princeton off, and they're coming back next year so they can play football. Oh, as someone who graduated from Dartmouth, I don't like to hear that, Rich. <laughs> Thanks They'll, for be ready for my you. <laughs> They'll be ready for the big green. Thanks, Rich, Rich. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're okay, great. You it's guys. always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. So okay. Much. See you. Appreciate yeah. it. That was Rich McKay, CEO and president of the Atlanta Falcons and Ira. Man, we could talk to him for hours. In fact, we just did. I think he, I, I think he might have just set a standard, Clark. Um, and I've never heard him better. Um, you know, you, you might spin 11 stories off this one, Judge. <laughs> uh, good questions and, and great answers. I think they're cheering, Ira, for Rich McKay. Right? Um, or else they're cheering for her. I was there, so. Rich, we uh, uh, Clark, we we know Rich is in Atlanta, but where where the heck were you, Clark? That's where were a, you? That's a darn good question. Thanks for asking, Ira. I was in New York City at the NFL Draft at Radio City Music Hall on April twenty third, two thousand five, and this is topical because who did we talk to yesterday? We talked talk to Pete Doherty of Green Bay about Aaron Rodgers, and in that draft. Aaron Rodgers was rumored to be a candidate for the first spot. San Francisco was drafting first. It was either Rodgers or Alex Smith. Or as we know, when San Francisco stood up there, announced a pick, it was quarterback Alex Smith. That wasn't what was notable. This was, they didn't choose Aaron Rodgers' Cal quarterback from the Bay Area who made it clear he wanted to play for the 49ers. And so he dropped and he dropped and he dropped until he was picked 24th, as everyone knows, by the Green Bay Packers with 21 teams passing on him. That included, of course, San Francisco. And I will never forget, we had the interviews on the ground floor of Radio City Music Hall. And I'll never forget watching him in the green room behind, remember, as he continued to slide, and you could see the steam coming out of his ears. He was angry. And so I'll never forget when he came down the, um, the steps, walked into the interview room and went, uh oh, this is worth listening to. And he was ticked. So he was asked if he was disappointed. And he said, quote, not as disappointed as the 49ers will be that they didn't draft me. And there was fire in his eyes. And I remember that. And I thought, wow, he's promising to make them pay. And you know what, Ira? They did. Now, of course, it looks like the team that took him might pay. But that was a day I'll never forget. That's outstanding. And Clark, you know what that reminds me of? I believe in their first meeting, Brady went up to uh, Robert Kraft and said, um, that's the best decision this this franchise will ever make, he taking did. me. And, you know, Brady was a nobody at, at that time. Uh, so, you know, Alex Smith did some good things. Uh, Clark had a good career, but he's not getting a gold jacket. And he's not Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, and you know, the irony, Ira, is that the guy who kind of made that decision, swung that decision, was Mike McCarthy, who was then at San Francisco. And then he becomes the head coach of Green Bay and inherits Aaron Rodgers. We know what happened there. Um, okay, Ira, final thoughts? 
Uh, well, I, I think we owe uh, Rich McKay. We, we told him 10 minutes. Clock, we told him 10 minutes. We kept him 35. Uh, his schedule is jammed. He's probably got Arthur Blank on uh, speed dial right now. But <laughs> you know what, Clark? I think he enjoyed it, and I hope our listeners did. I agree with you. I think they all enjoy it. Now, I read they all enjoy it each week. I know Ian does. Um, anyway, the thing I want to mention is um, something a little more serious is the passing of a uh, Former Chargers center, Courtney Hall. I don't know if you guys saw it, but last week he passed away at the age of 52. I covered him uh, in San, San Diego, and he was just a great guy, a, a terrific player, but more than that, a, a terrific young man. And so sad for me to hear that he passed away. So I, I wanted to mention that. Um, that's going to do it for today. Ira, please tell people where they can find you on Twitter. At iKaufman76. Ian Glendon, tell them where they can find you. At IGLEN31. I thought that was at TB12. No? <laughs> it, it was taken, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay. And you can find me at, at Clark Judge TOF. And as usual, as we always tell you, if we don't hear from you, and I have heard from people, including Wade and Winnetka, and as I mentioned, a couple of others, the Gudikins in uh, Phoenix and um, Nate in Florida. Anyway, I have heard from people, so please get in touch with us. And you know what? If you don't, if you don't do that, I promise you, you're going to hear from us next week, right here at, tell them, Ira. We, we take donations, Clark. We take <laughs> donations. At the eye test for two, Clark. The eye test for two. That's correct. We'll see you then. <laughs>